This week on CrossFeed. With our spe- special baby commentator, should we speak out for the persecuted? Does the Constitution extend to Facebook? Should Jesus be called the Son of God? Is Steve Jobs now sitting on an iCloud? Wash these Amish right out of my hair. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Good to be back with everybody. We uh, had a, I had my son's wedding, which went very well uh, for the most part. And uh, then last week was just Columbus Day weekend, which up here is a huge weekend. Oh, yeah. You know, there was actually, there was one of the stories that I was looking at for this week um, was about Columbus Day, because there have been a couple of books uh, recently saying that, uh, um, saying that it, it was trying to ward off the Muslims or something like that. Um, it was, it was kind of strange. Um, and, and I didn't pick it. Uh, but one thing about Columbus that we do know um, and the reason I'd pick it is because it's it's kind of controversial and and there's a lot of debate over whether it's true or not. Um, we do know that Columbus was a Christian, and um, and that he did want to bring the gospel to the Indies. That's and true. He did. We know that from his uh, his memoirs. So, and uh, 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 and also things didn't. Not everything turned out great after he. Had come to America, uh, not as all his fault. But so anyway, uh, yes. But Columbus Day is a huge day up here, and uh, everything has gone rather well. Uh, so let's go ahead and start out here. Well, probably the big news, probably the last two weeks, uh, really was the death of Steve Jobs. Uh, Dale and I are, are in mourning for for Saint Steve. We're both rapid Apple fans. Um, I've been on using Mac since 1986. Um, my first Mac was a Mac SE 30. Uh, oh, wonderful machine. Wonderful machine. I think it, you know, uh, could work. Well, what a workhorse machine that thing was. And uh, I don't know what Dale's first one was. My first Mac, we'll see. That's, I can talk about my first Mac, but my first Apple. I've been using Apple computers since. Let's see, I was in fifth grade, so that would make it 1982. Well, I guess my first Mac I used was an Apple II II, or an Apple IIe. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, the first one I really... Yeah, no, my first Mac was a Performa 410. Uh, Right after I got to seminary, we were looking for a computer to replace my Apple IIe. And um, we were at Walmart, and they were clearancing them out. We couldn't really afford anything, but we saw these things a, with a ridiculous clearance price. It was right around Christmas, and said, "Oh, we can't pass that up." And uh, so, been hooked ever since. Besides, it was the yeah, Dale, Dale, in the old uh, days of uh, of uh, uh, system seven, system eight. He had some great skins uh, of different uh, that I. I Downloaded a few of those and used them. He, he was quite creative. But anyway, uh, my good old buddy, he met Mita, uh, who has a wonderful book out, by the way, called uh, I Sold My Soul on eBay. Uh, and uh, uh, Mita, though he's an atheist, he, uh, he thinks very highly of churches. He thinks churches do a lot of good. He's just not convinced God exists. So, uh, but... Uh, uh, but he thinks churches do a lot of good. But he has this, and I thought it was good, the New Yorker had this thing of uh, Steve Jobs showing up at the pearly gates, and there's St. Peter, and St. Peter's looking up his name on an iPad. And, you know, he's saying, okay, I get the job. I get the joke. The joke, it's not about St. Peter's faith, I mean, about Steve Jobs' faith. It's about his products being everywhere, and, you know, it's it's kind of a fun joke here. 
But mm -hmm. you know what? On the other hand, Steve Jobs was Buddhist. He didn't believe in a pearly gate. Um, not sure what he believed. And then another, uh, uh, they, they took this from the Get Religion blog. And they got the Get Religion blog also highlighted a picture of George Carlin when he went to the gates. You know, there was St. Peter and saying, uh, you can't use those words here. You know, so this universalism idea here that's really being taught of that everybody goes to the gates. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, interesting thing about Steve Jobs is we know that he used to be Christian. In fact, he was confirmed uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran um, back in the day. But that was back in the 60s. And um, uh, growing up in California in the 60s apparently had an impact on him. And Well, he said at one point he had failed and he was so hungry he used to work, have to walk, uh, you know, what is it, five or six miles or seven miles. Number seven stiff jumps in my mind. Seven miles to a Hare Krishna temple to get a meal. That's probably where he got was uh, exposed to Eastern mysticism. Uh, actually, he it was in uh, some travels through India mm. uh, was where it really sort of uh, picked up on Zen Buddhism, and um, he um, it said that he walked around the office uh, barefoot, and um, and uh, the the sort of simpl uh, simplistic uh, concepts of of Zen. Uh, were a part of his home, and also um, they say um, his uh, products too. You know, you look at an iPhone; it's got one button. Mouse has one button, and in fact, um, now the trackpads on Mac uh, laptops have no buttons on them. Uh, unibody design, all you know, sorts of things like that. So you're saying he's teaching Zen Buddhism to the design of his computers? Yeah, that's the claim. I mean, there's all kinds of claims. They they said that his, uh, you know, his his black turtlenecks that he wore were um almost clergy like. Like, okay, wait, now you're comparing him to like a a pastor, you know, Roman Catholic priest or something like that. You know, all he's got to do is wear it inside out, so you see the little white tag, you know. <laughs> but uh, so you know. But, you know, then again, um, Apple computer uh, fans are called the cult of Mac or the, the cult of Apple. Um, and, uh, and you know, people often refer to uh, fans as, uh, say, it's like a religion. Um, so, you know, th this is one of those things that, and I was, I was reading some of the comments um, on the Friendly Atheist blog. And, and there are, you know, internet comments are always a mixed bag. Um, well, at best, they're a mixed bag. Uh, it's very rare that you have a really good, intelligent discussion on an internet blog comment section. Um, and for the most part, that was the case here too. It was, it was kind of a mix. And um, so, the the question is, um, really. On the you know people look at this this article here and, and they say well okay I think you're sort of blowing this out of proportion it's a joke it's not intended to you know to say anything about him and, and or anything else um, it's really about it's it's just a joke about the iPad you know and and you've got there's there were a number of other um, cartoons that showed Steve Jobs in heaven uh, one with a bunch of uh, little uh, baby like cherubs. Um, all playing with an iPad, and uh, uh, another one where he's there's a bunch of um, apple uh, shaped clouds and the um, something about iCloud or something like that, you know, and and it was just all kinds of of different things like that. Um, and but one of the comments in the blog that um, that really kind of struck me was this whole concept of that. All right, given that. Um, as far as we know, Steve Jobs um, renounced his Christian faith and um, and and embraced the tenets of Zen Buddhism. Right, which um, it's important to note is a philosophy and is not entirely a religion, although it has um, religious elements. And for most people, it is the religious um, expression in their life if if they embrace it. Um, to the exclusion of others, 
Um, I have known people that are able to, um, you could argue that it's syncretism, um, but they're able to pull uh, elements of both together without um, contradiction as far as, at least um, to their, uh, is, is the way they understand it. Um, he was, uh, you know, we, we really, we certainly don't see, um, anything in, in Steve's later life that would indicate that he still was holding on to the Christian faith, but, um, you know, I guess you can never completely rule it out. Um, I, I mentioned on Facebook this week that he was baptized and um, that's no small thing that God continues to work in the hearts of the baptized, um, even those who have walked away. And, um, you know, how much how much influence did God still have in his life? Uh, we don't know. It doesn't look like much, um, but ultimately we don't know the condition of a man's heart. Um, but, you know, what? It, as far as we know, and, you know, and this is really hard to say, is that as far as we know, um, Steve Jobs is, it's really hard to say. Um, he's in hell. Um, if, if he did, in fact, renounce his faith, um, you know, people look at him and they say, look at this guy, look at what great things he did and stuff like that. And, and while on the one hand, um, he never gave to charities, um, in fact, he, he said, he basically saw um, his accomplishments as his contribution to the world. Um, and many people would say, yeah, that's good enough for me. Um, but uh, you know, he giving to charity isn't going to get you into heaven either. And uh, so to, to, to look at that and say, well, you know, he was, a, he was still a good guy in the sense if you sort of ignore the way he treated his employees and, you know, and on and on. Um, well, he had a civic righteousness. He was not perfect. And, you know, yeah, I, you had the Gawker article where it talked about how hard he was to work with and, and, and things like that. Well, well, I guess, you know, you and I being Mac fans, we'd know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's been known for years that he was, you know, near the impossible to work for. Right. Because he had, you know, demands that were just incredible demands. So he was an imperfect human being. Um, you know, what got me, you know, okay, but he didn't believe in Christ. That was what it came down to. Therefore, as far as we know, he's a little warm right now. And, you know, when the one guy said, you know, I, he asked, you know, Christian friends how they handle that. And, you know, maybe we should, maybe it should be an ad campaign. Here are famous people that Christians say are in hell. But you know what? If you ask me, I would say, yes, he is. Not my decision, his. He chose to walk away from his faith. If it was up to me, he wouldn't be there. If it was mm -hmm. up to God, he wouldn't be there. You know, but he made a choice. He said, no, this Jesus stuff, I don't need it. Okay, now you all notice now I have a headphone on that I didn't a second ago. Uh, through the magic of uh, of editing, it just... Popped on there with you without you seeing it, so, <laughs> so it's really quite, quite exciting. Um, well, we're on computers, so let's talk about Facebook, All right? Um, and this is well, we'll get into one of the comments. Uh, and just one of those things. I I don't know. I have a real problem. So there's a teacher out in New Jersey. We don't. Uh, uh, her name is Vicky Knox, and uh, she said on her Facebook page uh, that um, her view of um, uh, um, homosexuality was a perverted spirit that has existed from the beginning of creation. Well, that's not true from the fall, but it's another story. And it's a sin that breeds like a cancer. Um, and... Uh, then somebody must have contacted her and said, this is not really smart to have this on a Facebook page where other people can see this. And so she took them down, but somebody else found them and copied them and has now put an out, uh, 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 a complaint with her school. Yeah. 
Um, now, the chances of her being fired over this are slim to none. Here's the chance, a situation where a teacher union is actually good because they have to fight for her. Even though they acknowledge that her comments are protected by the Constitution. You know, so, you know, once you say that, well, we acknowledge that these are protected by the Constitution. This is where you drop the investigation. This is not said in the classroom. This was not said to her students. This was on a private Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Probably yeah. not the smartest thing to say, but... No. And the other piece of the um, of this that's important to be part of it, and I'm, I'm not saying that... Um, well, it's just an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and that is that this was in response to a school display celebrating lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender history month. Um, so it was a reaction to that. Right. Um, because that's just it. You see, you have to celebrate this. This is always good. Right. You know, so, you know it, it's, it's intolerant to say, no, this isn't good. Uh, you have to say this is good, and you have to celebrate it and, and everything. Uh, but it's, it's not intolerant to say that, um, that her beliefs are bad. Um, you know, because educators have a responsibility to nurture their, their students as they develop and young adults, and that includes making sure they feel supported and know there's nothing wrong with being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered. Oh, that's not right. No. And, you know, um, um, you know, there it is, you know, that, you know, again, you have to affirm that this is okay. But, of course, if it's some kid who says, I really have problems with homosexuality, you have to teach that child. It's not okay to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's only one way of doing this. Yes, there's only one way to be tolerant and, right. and open-minded. Right. So, <laughs> um, All right. important lesson, right? If you, um, re- you're on the one hand, this is, I mean. Obviously, this is a very um, hypocritical uh, position um, that we see happening over and over in our culture, right? Because the um, definition of open-minded is that you agree with the establishment and uh, and and don't allow any other opinions. <laughs> right. Well, the other thing that offended me is this. Garden State Equality issued a statement questioning Knox's ability as a teacher to enforce the state's new anti-bullying law. This law was signed in, signed in January and considered among the toughest in the country for its requirement that students have anti-policies. The law was adopted after the suicide last year of Timer Clementi, a Rutgers University freshman whose roommate is accused of using a webcam to spy on an intimate cat counter with another man. Okay, number one. I may have problems with homosexuality. That doesn't make it right to pick on people. Right. Okay? See, I'm a little offended and upset that suddenly bullying is a big problem because it hurts gay kids. Because I would, I had the hell bullied out of me in, high, in junior high. Mm-hmm. I was picked on, beaten, stuffed in lockers. And you weren't gay? in the girls' locker room. No, I wasn't. And I'm not. But so you I mean there was see... bullying before that? <laughs> yeah, there was. And, uh, you know, I had, you know... I went, when I went down to Concordia, Missouri, the other kids couldn't understand what was wrong with me because every time they walked by me, I flinched. Because I used people walking by me and hitting me. Ah, don't do that! And so I read this, and it really upsets me. You know, and, you know, and then I read, I read things, you know, about kids who've been gay and, and being bullied. Okay, it's wrong. But it, you know what? Bullies do that. And they don't really care. The, the, the important thing is that you're smaller and weaker and you can't and than they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're just and looking then, for an excuse. You know, I mean, yeah, if, they, if they're, they're saying we're beaten up because you was gay, I wouldn't believe it for a second. They're doing it because they're bullies. Mm-hmm. And that just happens to be another reason, because they did it to me. Yep. Believe me, if I caught any kid bullying, I don't, I think I'm going to care. You know, it's, it's kind of like the, um, well, any kind of hate crime law. 
you know, where, you know, we want to punish people who kill, you know, white guys who kill blacks for, for because they're biased against them. You killed another human being. You deserve to be punished. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the color is. It's because they're human. Because they're human. And the same thing here. There are kids being bullied. That is wrong. Period. Mm -hmm. I Wait. don't. I, I. I may have. Pro I. I. I believe homosexuality is wrong. But you know what? You don't deserve to be bullied for it. And I deal with any kid I ever catch bullying another kid. And I'm actually in a place of authority that I can deal. <laughs> I can put a step to it. And I'll. I'll tell the bully. You picked the wrong guy to mess with. Because I was bullied. I know what he's going through. And this is my chance to exact some retribution. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's, I just really, really, I do get upset by it. Oh, yeah. I mean, and so, so wait, you're saying that you're against bullying, but you believe homosexuality is wrong? Right. But this says that if you, um, if you believe homosexuality is wrong, then, um, then you might not be able to enforce an uh, anti-bullying uh, position. That's right. Stupid rule, stupid thing to say. And, uh, you know, I really, you know, as, as, uh, 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 but something tells me he probably was never bullied. Or if he was, hate to say it, you were a gay kid who was bullied, and that's your excuse for being bullied. Mm. You know, but the problem is, what happens? What what about all the other? What about all the straight kids that have no excuse for being? They don't have that excuse, but they were bullied just as much. Yeah. What's the overweight kids or the girls that weren't as pretty? I was bullied. It was pretty much because uh, the guy that was bullying me was uh, probably getting a whole lot worse at home from family members than what he was given to me. Um. And he was right. just taking it out on somebody, and since I was not a fighter, uh, I was an easy target. Yep, I wasn't a fighter either. So, you know, and uh, so I just really get offended by thinking people making those kind of statements anymore. Yeah, because bullying has gone on for a long time, and it's always been wrong. Mm -hmm. But now, all of a sudden, it's a, it's a problem. So, at the same time, all right, be careful what you post on Facebook. You know, I mean, it's, it's just like you, you see the baby here. All right. I've made a decision that um, I will not post anything on Facebook involving body fluids, no matter how tempted I am. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've had some really amusing things to say, too, but I've kept them to myself. It's been painful. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Let's get off this before I get into anything that really gets me more upset than I am with that stuff. Anyway, hey, we got to talk about this Amish guy. Because speaking here, of bullies. Yeah, well, yeah, speaking of bullies, here, here it is. Because, man, what a, this guy is 66 years old, Sam Mullet, and he's going around giving guys a haircut. I wonder if he's giving them a mullet. <laughs> he, he's offended that these other Amish people are, you know... Business in the front, and party in the right. back instead of right. the other way that's, around. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you get, for those who don't know what a mullet is, Dale, do you want to you know ex explain it to them? It's a uh, kind of spiked hair, and then long hair in the back. Um, popular in the eighties uh, among rednecks. Yeah, well, Billy Ray Cyrus is one of them who had his hair in the, in the mullet. So, yeah, I, did, I read this. I thought, oh, man, what a pun. You know, what a, what a great last name for a guy that they're giving haircuts. <laughs> so, okay. On the other hand, this guy's kind of, this guy's a real jerk. He, uh, I can't quite figure out the deal. Okay, so he's, we're dealing with Amish on Amish crime here. Mm -hmm. And this guy said the Amish are too liberal for him. And so he took a breakaway group 15 years ago, and they live even by stricter things. Well, and uh, apparently he's rather authoritarian and vindictive. And he's had a bunch of things going on for years. But anyway, so um, he and a bunch of his buddies grabbed a couple of uh, Amish men, uh, 
and one of them is October 3rd, and there's the 70 – alleged. Allegedly this happened. We better say that. Otherwise, we could get oh, sued. And, and he didn't do it? But yeah, just in case he's watching this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, just in case he's watching this. <laughs> um, it wasn't him. It was two of his sons and another guy. Uh, okay. What was his name? Um, let's see. Mullet, mullet, Mohawk. No, Miller. <laughs> Miller. Anyway, so these guys were out there, and they uh, – uh, we're talking 74-year-old uh, uh, Raymond Hirschberger, who is an uh, Amish bishop, and said, oh, well, yeah, I want to talk about religion and talk about the weather. And then they said, we're here from Sam Mullet to get revenge. Zimmerly. Zimmerly is his name. Oh, no, he's the sheriff. I'm sorry. And uh, so they held the man down, and they used scissors and a battery-powered clipper. Don't ask me what in the world Amish guys are doing using battery-powered clippers, but they are. And they cut their beards, and they cut their hair. Which, you know, once they marry, Amish men don't do that. Again, this was a great uh, insult and a great pain and, and very horrible thing to have happen uh, among, in their religion. And uh, then they went, let him go, and then they took him, went and did it to another house, to an, another Amish guy. Apparently, there's been some other things going, too. So, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of, like, putting Rogaine on a skinhead. A very nice brain. But the opposite. Yeah, but I think that's a little, probably a little bit mild. Um, I mean, uh, I'm not sure how you could, you know, feeding, I, I know. feeding, uh, feeding a Muslim pork. Yeah, yeah, that's probably it. Force feeding. Yeah, um, or a Muslim or, or Orthodox Jew pork. So. Yeah. Or shaving a uh, um, uh, Sikhs or. or um, there was actually another article yeah. this week that I didn't pick up, but um, y- if you see a Sikh man, they're more noticeable, I think, than the women. Um, the you'll see him wearing a turban and a beard, and because um, they have rules about uh, not removing any hair from your body. Yeah. So, so yeah, it'd be like that. There is evil there that does not sleep. So, so yeah, I mean. It's, it's bizarre um, crime. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Well, some of the I mean, and this guy, man, this uh, Sam Mullet, he's got some interesting kids overall. Um, yeah, he he's got his thirty-eight uh, uh, year old Johnny Mullet and twenty-six year old Lester Mullet, who are the two guys who took part in this thing, and then he's got a, another son. Doesn't say how old he is, but he was convicted of unlawful sexual conduct with a minor. And uh, then he has another son, um, Eli Mullet, who uh, threatened the sheriff and was sentenced to probation. So he's. He I'm wondering about this. Here. Yeah, this um, strict uh, upbringing that he wanted to give them. <laughs> I think either it was just, it was either uh, not strict enough. Or uh, way too strict. Yeah. I mean, he uh, says, uh, he says, it says, Mullet denies ordering beard cuttings, but he says he wouldn't stop them. Yeah. So. I wonder if you could call him David. You know? <laughs> King David was real, apparently real strict with his children, but he didn't know. On the other hand, he has, uh, you know, 17 kids, he says, at least. <laughs> Those kids is driving me crazy! Now, <laughs> now, who knows? Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> anytime, <laughs> anytime someone asks you how many kids you have, and you have to start it out by saying at least, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of a strange uh, situation here. Amish on Amish crime, uh, violence. That, that, I thought that was interesting. And you put. By the way, I wonder who taught this guy it says, at Worcester College. W O O S T E R. Who taught him how to spell Worcester? It's W O R C E S T E R. That's how people spell it in Massachusetts. Well, this is in Ohio, and we spell things differently here. Oh, okay. Man. Uh, not, not familiar with that um, particular college. He probably pronounced the word idea instead of idea or two. I don't understand you people. <laughs> anyway. 
<laughs> oh, to make me laugh, you to shake the baby and wake her up. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, well, let's let, let's deal with uh, speaking of people being picked on, bullied, beaten, um, convicted, tried for their faith. Uh, this case in Iran, mm-hmm. uh, Pastor Nad Darkani. Now, uh, this has gotten to be kind of a big issue here lately. Thankfully. Uh, what? Thankfully. Thankfully, yes. Um, he's an evangelical pastor um, and um, in Iran and has um, was charged with apostasy for converting from Islam to Christianity and sentenced to death by hanging. He was, however, given the chance to um, recant his conversion. Three times he was given the chance, and he refused. But now it's gone up to uh, uh, the crazy guy who's the president, and he's supposed yeah, to make I a decision. Um, no, no, no. no. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Um, yeah, sorry. No, I Khomeini. told Khomeini is, is above him. No. Uh, um, Khomeini is dead. Uh or, Kahamani, uh, the the guy who says that the, the 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 Holocaust never happened, and they have no gay people in Iran, uh, so uh, uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm not even going to touch that line. But anyway, so he's the uh, 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 he's yeah Ali Kahamani, Iran's supreme leader. Yeah, and no, so, that's that's oh, not is, the president. Oh, that's not the president. He, yeah, see, the supreme leader. You're right. That's a little known thing about Iran is that the president is actually like 14th in power. Um, yeah, I can't remember his name. Um, but anyway, whatever it is, so they're, they're asking him what to do about him, and they're expected to get a comment sometime this week. Uh, one of the interesting things about him is that um, he's not guilty of apostasy. He's right. never Muslim. Nope. No. No. His ancestors were Muslim. But he never was. And so technically, according to their law, is that you can't convert from Islam. Yep. Um and but he never did. He was accused of it. Um and I mean it shows you what kind of kangaroo courts they have in Iran. But yeah, no. He never actually was any time in his life a Muslim, and so therefore, she's okay. Um, mm-hmm. um, therefore, yeah, he. This should be an open and shut case. Even even if we had apostasy laws in America, all right, this this would still be like, oh well, did you actually convert from Islam? No, I never was as Muslim. Oh, okay, fine. Go home, you know. But so yeah, he's he's being charged for something that he didn't do. Um when even what he is being charged with shouldn't be illegal because it's basically thought crime. Um Right. Now if you I I mean if you understand um and, and some people may wonder how, how could you grow up in Iran and not be Muslim? Well, Remember that you know up till 1970, in the mid 70s, when the Ayatollah Khomeini took over, Iran was a secular state under the Shah, mm-hmm. and uh, there was no official religion there. And so, and actually, it was a quite cosmopolitan um, mixture and polyglot of people there. Um, I was talking with. Um, uh, our Iranian members, and she said, you know, it, it was very, it was very secular, uh, very much like she said it was very much like a mid-eastern Paris. She said it was, you know, very, very free, very. It was a wonderful place to live. And then this guy came in, and everything went black. And uh, you know, Islamic law has been shoved in, but so there are a lot of people who were Christian, who were Zoroastrian, who were nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, up to that time, and some of their children were raised Christian or Zoroastrian or nothing. Right. 
So, um, and in his case, I can't, I think this guy was nothing before he became Christian. Uh, but so pray for him, pray for his release. Uh, oh, anyway, the situation is his, his, uh, lawyer is saying, uh, there's been all this uproar and international pressure. And he's saying, well, it's not really help- helping. It has not had any impact on the Iranian court. Mm-hmm. Um, the court works on the evidence and on Iranian law. Uh, I don't think the statements in the United States has had any impact either on this case as it's been going through the Iranian justice system, which is based on the law and evidence. Um, <laughs> wow. Except for the evidence part. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's had an impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you can't, I mean, because they, as they're going through this, they know that whatever decision they make is going to have an international um, repercussion. And, uh, you know, so they have to very carefully weigh their decisions. Right. It's not just um, the United States. It's also other Western European nations, many of whom actually do have some sort of relationship with them, which we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, not to mention the fact that the United States has a pretty heavy influence on the Iraqis who are sitting right next door. Yeah. So, um, no, that's kind of a... But pray for him. Pray that he is released. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, even if he's released, I don't know if he could remain pastor there or if he'd have to get out of the country. Um, you know, I could see them sentencing him to exile. Uh, this is a reminder that um, Christian persecution still goes on today, um, more than ever. And uh, in fact, uh, coming up next month, uh, November 13th, is International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Uh, we're having a special service. Last year, uh, we had a member of our congregation speak, who is from Indonesia, uh, and she uh, talked about what it's like to live there as a Christian. Um, this year, it's kind of hitting home for us because she's back in Indonesia right now. And um, and you may have heard in the news uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a bombing. It was actually a sister church of Saddleback, Rick Warren's church, um, that was not too far from where she is. It wasn't her, because ch- she does attend a Christian church there. Um, it wasn't too far from her. And then there was another bombing of a, of another Christian church. And, um, you know, so she's pretty uncomfortable right now. And so, you know, we're, uh, it's, it's really, it hits home for our congregation just because that's one of our own, um, who's there and in danger. And so we're very concerned about her and, um, and trying to do what we can to help her out. I understand that. Well, speaking of Muslims, this comes to our our last story of the night. Um, And it's an interesting, I thought it was a fascinating story, actually. Uh, It's interesting because I actually was reading reading this story earlier in the week. Um, And it deals with the question, how do you translate contextually? Uh, So... And Christianity had reported on this a while back, and um, that there is to call Jesus the Son of God in Muslim in, in Muslim cultures. Um, the word "son" has the assumption in it. The word "son." Uh, that has the uh, implication in uh, Arabic that he is the procreated son of God. That, uh, you know, that uh, 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 the Mormons were right. (laughs) And, uh, or remember that extremely offensive... uh, Add where was it in England? Poor Joseph. After God the Father, he just couldn't measure up. Mm-hmm. You know, New uh, Zealand, yeah, yeah, or wherever that was. Um, and so, but of course, that you know could not. That's you know very offensive to Muslims to have that any any indication there. Um, and so it got to be a question: How do we translate? And so there were some of these. Um, 
uh, translations that were a bit more of a paraphrase that were running around. And they were saying things like, uh, the beloved son sent from God. Instead or just of using, the Christ. Or just the Christ, yes. Um, and the Wycliffe Bible translators came out and said, you know what? It's one thing how you do things in apologetics, but we translate. Therefore, we have to. Yeah, it was the beloved son who comes or originates from God. That was the term that they were often using. Um, and so it, it brings to the question then, uh, um, you know, we you should not use that term. And uh, so, but now with the Wycliffe Bible translators is saying, no, if we're going to translate Scripture correctly, we have to translate it as it says. We can't make a, there are missionaries, there are Bible translators. Or hmm. Bible translators. Right. But, I mean, you know, this is a tough thing. Even even in English, uh, you know, for instance, in the... Um, you know the in the King James you'll see the the sons of Israel, right? And most modern translations translated the children of Israel. Well, if you understand uh, Hebrew culture, sons of Israel is is actually the better translation, even though it could mean either one, just because the word son isn't so much a term associated with procreation uh, as it is with the heir. Mm -hmm. And um, which really comes in where um, in uh, Romans, where it says we're adopted as sons. And um, which means we receive the inheritance. And, um, it, you know, and, and that's that's really important. And, and that, it's the whole concept of of inheritance. And, and so but the problem is, is that if you say we're sons of God, um, then you you confuse people. That say, well, how can I be a son of God? I'm a woman, um, but you know, I always tell people whenever I, I talk about that terminology, I say, well, that's okay because um, we're also the bride of Christ. So, right. Well, I always tell them because only sons could inherit property, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if if uh, they call you know you know, and, and it's important that all men and women are called sons of God because that means then that we all inherit. Today we would simply say the children of God, but you know, in that day, if Jesus said the sons and daughters of God, then that would mean that the men go, to, the men will inherit eternity, the women won't. That's how they would have understood it. Okay, um, yeah, here it is. The problem, however, far surpass. This is from uh, Christianity Today in February this year. The problem, however, far surpasses a theological argument between Muslims and Christians. In fact, the Quran at Tauba 930, says God cursed anyone who would utter the ridiculous blasphemy that Jesus could be Ibn, Ibn Allah, Nullah, a son of God. Not only do Muslims disagree with Christians about the identity and nature of Jesus, they also incur a curse for even mentioning the phrase son of God. Even though... Uh, 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 Pious Muslims would sooner leave the presence of someone who utters the phrase than risk judgment in hell for hearing it. Even those who lack such devout scruples um, think hearing or reading Son of God will bring bad luck. Many avoid associating with Westerners altogether, regarding as them as polytheists who harbor strange ideas about God's family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the um, there's is. There's a bit in the Quran that says something to the effect of uh, it basically defines the Trinity as uh, God, Jesus, and Mary. Yes. So, um, you know, the what what we see there is that Muhammad Muhammad had a misunderstanding of Christianity, um, which also, you know, if you want to call the Quran the Word of God, you also have to sort of um, shut your eyes to the fact that it contains um, many errors. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I suppose they would have to say, well, no, Christians just don't understand what they believe or something like that. So, but, um, 
but no, this is a huge deal when, um, you know, when you want to try to convey uh, a particular concept, um, but that particular word that you're looking for doesn't exist in that language or it doesn't translate, it, it has other implications. Um, you know, this even comes through, it's the reason that there's, uh, speaking of translations, there are two Klingon translations of the Bible. And there's, there's two, and I mean, just the fact that there would be two of them. Um, and, and one of the points of debate was over the word lamb because, um, and you know, uh, according to Star Trek lore, uh, on the Klingon homeworld, there's no such thing as a lamb. Um, there's a critter that looks kind of like a lamb, but it's a vicious, a vicious, nasty thing. Right. And so, you know, if you want to translate it and, and use something that kind of looks like a lamb, uh, it really misses that whole concept of a, a gentle kind of, um, creature. And, uh, and then I, f I forget what the other school does with it. Um, but, so. Those people with too much time on their hands. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so the, it, it, this has really got to be a, a, a very big issue. Um, and uh, it really came out of the Presbyterian Church in America then. And uh, so the translators are saying, look, uh, and the uh, SIL, Summer Institute in Linguistics, that's it. Um, they are going to say that, no, you are going to have to go with the term Son of God. And, uh, you know, that in most cases, that literal translation is to be preferred. Um, maybe you could do things to explain it, but, uh, you know, ultimately you have to. Uh, and it was agreed to by uh, even the people of the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary. Um, you know, uh, um, it did, you know, to touch... Um, you know, they said um, uh, in the necessity of leaving phrases such as son of God alone because familial, familial language is the basis for the doctrine of the Trinity. So, yeah, in, in every um, time and in every culture, there's going to be parts of the Bible that you just have to stop and explain. All right. And so if that's a, a point of contention, you don't start with that. Right. Well, there's even certain certain phrases we have to to stop and explain. Uh, there is Jesus' very famous phrase calling himself the son of man. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? I mean, not even biblical scholars all agree what that term means. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, I'd say you have to jump back to the book of Daniel to get the answer to that one. You know, well, there are those who pick, pick a book, look at Daniel and one like a son of man. Uh, there are, you know, um, there are those who um, say, you know, he was talking, he's the heir of humanity. He is the ultimate human, uh, the one who is inheriting all things, uh, really kind of referencing himself as the second Adam by that phrase. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can talk, but, you know, you can talk all day about why, you know, and, 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 you know, why did Jesus, you know, he sounds almost like some of these politicians, you know. Well, you talk to Bob Dole, and Bob Dole will tell you, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, they talk about this third person, and here Jesus is going around saying, you know, but the Son, you know, well, the Son of Man find, uh, you know, the Son of Man came to seek those who are lost. Why did he talk about himself in the third person? <laughs> yeah, and there's a whole debate about, you know, you can really look into why does he refer to himself in the third person like that? Is it, um, you know, is it to avoid uh, being um, being arrested? Yep. Be, you know, well, you, you didn't say he was. You said the son of man. You, you... Yeah. So he referred to himself there. But uh, the, back to this, this issue, there is always going to be a difficulty in contextualization. And I think, you know, uh, and, and uh, the article in, in February's uh, Christianity Today, you know, talked about, you know, trying to witness among Muslims, you know, being the hardest of soils. Mm. Yeah. So how do you make that in a, a, a real clear instance? Right. For people? Because what it comes down to is uh, as difficult as it may be to explain some of these concepts, uh, these are people that Jesus died for. Mm -hmm. He loves them and he wants them to know him. 
He wants right. them to be part of his family. And even uh, as we are. Yeah. And and so uh therefore it's uh imperative to us to find ways to communicate that to them in ways that they'll understand. So this has been a good discussion. We've had a lot of good discussions tonight, and we thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this is uh, kind of a labor of love, and Dale and I. Uh, I also tonight want to special, uh, thank especially our special baby commentator. Uh, you heard a few uh, uh, comments coming in here and there. So uh, um, insightful, as always. <laughs> yeah. She sleeps with her eyes open, too. <laughs> So, all right. Um, well, and um, by the way, I have to apologize after the last episode. I actually just finally got it out this morning. Um, so today being what the sixteenth, and um, it's just <laughs> one thing about having a baby in the house is that uh, you you don't have as much free time as you used to. Clearly, <laughs> sort of doubling up here. So you have older daughters. Put them to work. <laughs> They're in bed. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. So, well, except for the one that just got back from band practice. So. But, uh. Okay. Some people come up with excuses. So, yeah, so consequently, the, the show doesn't always get um, edited and posted, you know, with the the uh, punctuality uh, that it used to. So. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. Take care, and God bless your day. Yep. Oh, and uh, any feedback, uh, we love hearing from you, podcast at com, or leave a comment on YouTube or any of the other places where you're watching this. So thanks, everybody. Good night. God bless.